Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace and peace of God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. The big point about the penitential rite is to discover what may stand between us and the Lord and his holy will, so that we can repent, to prepare ourselves to receive the word of God, in his most precious body and blood in the Holy Eucharist. I invite you to do that now. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned through my own fault in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do. And I ask Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, 
all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Let us pray. Merciful Father, may our acts of penance bring us your forgiveness. Open our hearts to your love and prepare us for the coming feast of the resurrection. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. <clears throat> Israel loved Joseph best of all his sons, for he was the child of his old age, and he had made him a long tunic. When his brothers saw that their father loved him best of all his sons, they hated him so much that they would not even greet him. One day, when his brothers had gone to pasture their father's flocks at Shechem, Israel said to Joseph, Your brothers, you know, are tending our flocks at Shechem. Get ready, I will send them to you. So Joseph went after his brothers and caught up with them in Dothan. They noticed him from a distance, and before he came up to them, they plotted to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes that master dreamer. Come on, let us kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns here. We could say that a wild beast devoured him. We shall then see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to save him from their hands, saying, We must not take his life. Instead of shedding his blood, he continued, just throw him into that cistern there in the desert, but don't kill him outright. His purpose was to rescue him from their hands and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came up to them, they stripped him of the long tunic he had on. Then they took him and threw him into the cistern, which was empty and dry. Then they sat down to their meal. Looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead, their camels laden with gum, balm, and resin to be taken down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What is to be gained by killing our brother and concealing his blood? Rather, let us sell him to these Ishmaelites instead of doing away with him ourselves. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh. His brothers agreed. They sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. Verbum Domini. Remember the marvels the Lord has done. When the Lord called down a famine on the land and ruined the crop that sustained them, he sent a man before them, Joseph, sold as a slave. They had weighed him down with fetters, and he was bound with chains, till his prediction came to pass, and the word of the Lord proved him true. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people set him free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions.
Dominus Vobiscum, et vos spiritus tuum, Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secunda Matthaeum, Gloria Divinomine. Jesus said to the chief priest and elders of the people, Listen to this parable. There was a property owner who planted a vineyard, put a hedge around it, dug out a vat, and erected a tower. Then he leased it out to tenant farmers and went on a journey. When vintage time arrived, he dispatched his slaves to the tenants to obtain his share of the grapes. The tenants responded by seizing the slaves. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. A second time, he dispatched even more slaves than before, but they treated them the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, thinking, they will respect my son. When they saw the son, the tenants said to one another, here is the one who will inherit everything. Let us kill him, and then we shall have his inheritance. With that, they seized him, dragged him outside the vineyard, and killed him. What do you suppose the owner of the vineyard will do to those tenants when he comes? They replied, he will bring that wicked crowd to a bad end and lease his vineyard out to others who will see to it that he has grapes at vintage time. Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the keystone of the structure? It was the Lord who did this, and we find it marvelous to behold. For this reason I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation that will yield a rich harvest. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard these parables, they realized he was speaking about them. Although they sought to arrest him, they had reason to fear the crowds who regarded him as a prophet. Verbum Dahomini. The commonality between these two readings is the sin of envy. It's one of the capital sins. Do you remember them? Pride, greed, lust, anger, gluttony, envy, and sloth. Envy is sadness that comes over us at the good fortune of other people. If you ever want to cultivate unhappiness, Cultivate envy. It will really bring you down. Some people think that greed and excessive desire for money is the root of all evil. But I believe even a deeper root than greed is the sin of envy. It's the history of the human race. It's the history recorded in sacred scriptures too like the fall of the angels. It was envy that deprived them of their position in heaven for the a eternity of an angel's existence. They wanted to be like God, and that's why Lucifer and his crowd are so quick to bring others down in the same fashion. It's humility and the humble heart that saves us from that fall. 
Maybe that's why in the beautiful Franciscan tradition, we have the story of Brother Pacifico, who saw St. Francis sitting in heaven in the place that Lucifer lost. But you don't have to believe that, though. Jesus was delivered up out of envy. That's right in the scriptures. Joseph's brothers, in the first reading here, it was envy. He was a special favorite of his father who made him a wonderful coat. And they couldn't take that one. It's a sin of our first parents too, Adam and Eve, who wanted to be like God, eating from that tree of good and evil. And Cain and Abel. Why did Cain kill Abel? Because Abel's sacrifice was acceptable to God and Cain's sacrifice was not. That truly saddened him. And you remember the story of Saul, who killed his thousands. But the maiden sang that David killed his tens of thousands, and Saul wasn't going to take that, so he would add one to his number by going after the life of David to finish him off. And underneath all of the megalomaniacs of history, like Hitler and Stalin and Mussolini, and the terrorists too, whether they be in Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, or North Korea. It's envy. Oh, I know the religious rhetoric gets them carried away, but that's just on the surface. Deep down underneath, if they really understood themselves, they know it's that sadness that comes over them at the good fortune of other people. Don't give in to it. It will finish you. It's the universal temptation. Everybody gets hit with it sooner or later. They say young people are tempted to sins of the flesh, sensuality, impurity, and the like. I know some old people who get temptations like that too, though. The ordinary temptation of older people is the temptation to greed. But the universal temptation to old, middle-aged, and young is this temptation to envy. No matter how virtuous you are, or think you are, or whatever your age, don't give in to it. St. Francis de Sales, a wonderful writer, admitted once that he was tempted to envy when he heard another bishop being praised for being a good preacher. Would you believe that one? Of course, that can never happen in the United States of America, only overseas. St. Francis of Assisi would call envy a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a pretty strong expression. Blasphemy is a frontal attack upon God. How can envy become blasphemy? And maybe this is the explanation. You know, all these gifts that other people have, their face, their figure, their talent, their possessions, their kids, their cars, their homes, and all the rest are really God's gift to them in the long run. Or God has given them the ability to produce such. God's providence is identified with himself. And if you attack God's providence, you are attacking God himself. And that's how envy becomes blasphemy. In the New Catechism, it makes a point that surprised me to be aware of those sins of coveting, like the ninth and the tenth commandment. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. But the root of that coveting really is envy. It leads to all the sins against charity. That's why some of the authors would say that envy is a grave sin. And the higher the thing that you envy, the greater the sin is, leading to hatred as Joseph's brothers did. They wanted to kill him. That's sad. Some people do not make the distinction between envy and jealousy. But there is a distinction, and the dictionary makes provision for it, too. It's a question of possession. 
If I am envious of you, I do not possess it, and I am sad because you do. Jealousy, strictly speaking, I possess it, and I don't want anybody to cut in on me. I'm jealous of my friend. The invitation with this sort of temptation is emulation. You see the good things in other people. You would like to have that yourself, and you aspire to exercise yourself to bring yourself to that position. I think this is the basis of athletic rivalry, and it's very healthy as long as you do not use immoral means to achieve your ends. Like in former Olympics, did you hear what they used to do? These young girls would become pregnant at the hands of their coaches and then have an abortion so they could get a great blood supply and oxygen to have an unfair competition. In the United States, it's outlawed, not because it's abortion, but because it's an unfair rivalry practice. If you cultivate happiness, you will get rid of envy. Only the grateful are happy. Only the humble are grateful. Only the humble are happy. And envy is neither happy nor humble, ever. But out of all of this envy and the pain and suffering that envy brings into the world, like with the fall of the angels and our first parents, and ourselves too in so many ways, the Lord can bring some beautiful things out of this. This is how he saved the Jewish people from famine through Joseph when he was sent down into Egypt where the Jewish people stayed for 450 years. The Lord can write straight with crooked lines. And Jesus delivered up out of envy really gives you and me the Paschal mystery, his death and resurrection. It would have been good, though, if the scribes and the Pharisees had accepted the Messiah. Wouldn't it be great to have like 1,200 people like St. Paul bringing the message to North and South America, Europe, Asia, the Middle East and Oceania, Australia and the rest? The world would have been converted very, very quickly. But when plan A is thwarted by our free will, our God goes to plan B or C or X, Y, or Z. He will not be thwarted in the end. And all of the martyrs who suffered as they have, it looked like tragedy. Maximilian Colby, you know that story. St. Thomas More. Joan of Arc, the young one at 19, the maid of Orléans. Now the glory of France. Think of Francis Thompson, too, the great poet, dope addict and alcoholic, who wrote perhaps the most beautiful poem that was ever put into the English language. Calls Almighty God a hound dog, pursuing the soul, pursuing you and me. And right at the end of that poem, that line spoken by the hound dog, by our God, all which I took from thee I did but take, not for thy harms, but just that thou might seek it in my arms. Or the soul speaking to God in that poem, is my gloom after all, but the shade of thy hand outstretched caressingly. Even in the hurts of life coming from the envy of other people, our God still loves us. And he will work something out from it. Suffering makes us think. Thinking makes us wise. Wisdom makes life tolerable. Divine wisdom, incarnate wisdom, Jesus Christ can make suffering even a joy because he takes us by the hand through the Garden of Gethsemane up over the hill of Calvary into the morning, the garden of the resurrection. Yes, he whispers to us in our pleasures, but he shouts to us in our pains. Suffering is the divine megaphone to arouse a dull and drowsy world. 
per crucem ad lucem, through the cross, to the light. And that's why our best focus through all the hurts of life, even from the envy coming from other people who cannot stand us, our best consolation comes from the Lord Jesus and him crucified. There he hangs, pale figure pinned against the wood. God grant that I may love him as I really know I should. I draw a little closer to share that love divine and almost hear him whisper, Ah, foolish child of mine, if I should now embrace you, my hands would stain you red. And if I leaned to whisper, the thorns would pierce your head. And then I knew in silence that love demands a price. T'was then I learned that suffering is but the kiss of Christ. We pray to the Father who sent his Holy Spirit to bring new life to the hearts of us all. For the church, may she be guided and governed by the Holy Spirit so that all who call themselves Christians will be led in the way of truth and hold the faith and unity of spirit. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For world, world leaders, may they strive to promote justice and peace in the world. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the sick and those who suffer in any way, may the Lord bring them comfort and healing and strengthen them through the victory of Calvary. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For fallen away Catholics, may they hear in their hearts the resounding call of Christ to return to the fold and to follow faithfully the way, the truth, and the life. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the faithful departed, in God's mercy, may they be freed from their sins and enjoy new life in the company of the saints. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That all people who have abortions and who perform abortions will come to appreciate life from the very first moment of conception, we pray to the Lord. Lord hear our for full recover for our dear mother, Angelica, we pray to the Lord. Lord hear our and for Father William Homilak and Peggy Gorham, on this their special day, we pray to the Lord. Lord hear our Father in heaven, overwhelm us with your grace so that we will always cooperate with what you want us to do to bring others to your kingdom and bring the happiness that you want all of us to enjoy. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Thank you. 
pray, my brothers, my sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. God of mercy, prepare us to celebrate these mysteries. Help us to live the love they proclaim. We ask this in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right. Father, all-powerful and ever-living God, we do well always and everywhere to give you thanks. This great season of grace is your gift to your family to renew us in spirit, to give us strength to purify our hearts, to control our desires, so to serve you in freedom. You teach us how to live in this passing world with our hearts set on the world that will never end. Now with all the saints and angels, we praise you forever. fountain of all holiness. Let your spirit come upon these gifts to make them holy, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Before he was given up to death, a death he freely accepted, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. supper was ended he took the cup again he gave you thanks and praise gave the cup to his disciples and said take this all of you and drink from it this is the cup of my blood the blood of the new and an everlasting covenant it will be shed for you and for all so that sins may be forgiven do this in memory of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of In memory of his death and resurrection, 
We offer you, Father, this life-giving bread, this saving cup. We thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. May all of us who share in the body and blood of Christ be brought together in unity by the Holy Spirit. Lord, remember your church throughout the world. Make us grow in love together with John Paul, our Pope, David, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember our brothers and sisters who have gone to their rest in the hope of rising again. Bring them and all the departed into the light of your presence. Have mercy on us all. Make us worthy to share eternal life with Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, with the apostles and with all the saints who have done your will throughout the ages. May we praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ. of the Holy Spirit. All glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. Precepta salutaribus moniti, et divina institutione formati, audemus dicere. Domine ab omnibus malis, da propitius pacem in diebus nostris, ut ope misericordiae tui ad uti, et a peccato simus semper liberi, et ab omni perturbatione secori, expectantes beatam stem, et adventum salutoris nostri, Jesu Christ. Domine Jesu Christe, qui existi apostolus tuis, patrimer linguo vobis, patrimeum do vobis, ne respicias peccata nostra, Sed vidam ecclesiae tuae, eamque secundum voluntatum tuum pacificare, e coadunare dineris, qui vivis et venias in secula seculorum. Amen. Pax Domini sit semper vobisco.
Ece agnus Dei, ece qui tolit peccato mundi, beati qui acenam agni vocati sunt, domini non sum dignus, ut in tressum tectum meum, sed tantum dic verbo, et zanabitur animum. For those who cannot now receive Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, we offer the following prayer. O oh Jesus, I turn toward the Holy Tabernacle, where you live hidden for love of me. I love you, O oh my God. I cannot now receive you in Holy Communion. Come nevertheless and visit me with your grace. Come spiritually into my heart. Purify it, sanctify it, render it like unto your own. Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Amen.
Let us pray. Lord, may this communion so change our lives that we may seek more faithfully the salvation it promises. Grant this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Dominus Bobisco. Ecum sive tu tuo. Benedicat vos omnipotens Deus. Pater et filius et spiritus sanctus. Amen. Amen.